All righty, I think we're ready to go. Everybody have a lesson outline and a map. If you don't raise your hand, one of the ushers will bring you one. So we've been going through the book of 1 Samuel. A uh, quick review, bring you up to date in case you weren't here last time or two. Samuel is now an old man. He's the prophet, priest, and judge of Israel. And... Uh, his sons were both rotten, and so the, the elders of Israel knew that they needed a new leader, and the people were wanting a king because all the nations around them had a king. And, of course, Samuel told them, no, God is your king. But they persisted, and Samuel went to God, and God said, tell them all the things a king, an earthly king, will take from them, and then maybe they'll reconsider. So Samuel and uh, about chapter 7 I think went through this whole list of things that an earthly king takes and then what he doesn't take he taxes we know about taxes April 15th coming up right anyway and so Samuel educated them about what a king will take and he thought that would change their mind but they still wanted the king so he went back to God and God said let them have a king anyway so um, and <laughs> Also, God told them, don't tell them to come whining to me when they find out what the king will take. Anyway, so sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. Anyway, so uh, God allows them to have a king. And so tall, handsome Saul is anointed the king. And in the last lesson, uh, chapter 12, was Samuel's farewell address. And so he, we will actually see him a time or two more in the next chapter or two, but really this is the... Last chapter was uh, the last time it just uh, was mostly about Samuel. And what he did, he challenged us and them to live their lives not just for themselves, but to live their lives as if they were living God's story. And so we approach that lesson as think back to when you were a child and you lived in your parents' house. It was not all about you. Your parents were large and in charge, and you lived in their house. And so we, as we went through the chapter, we looked at how, what Samuel taught them to do and how to live and how we applied that to living in God's house. And we applied that as an opportunity for us to make a commitment to God, each of us, for living in God's house for 2024. And here we're, if you look at your review there, so our commitment to God for 2024 is that living in my father's house, I will live his story. In other words, it's not about me. If I'm a Christian, if I'm a disciple, my life is about God. Living in my father's house, I will live without blame to all men. Living in my father's house, I will live remembering the power and providence of my father Living in my father's house, I understand that my loving father will discipline me. Samuel talked about that, and as we think back to our childhood, our, our parents disciplined us. That's what they're supposed to do, but they do it for our good. Living in my father's house, I will, serve my, I will live to serve my father, focusing on the future, not the empty things of life. Living in my father's house, I will never cease to pray and study my father's word because he adopted me, he loves me, and he has an inheritance for me. Now before we get into chapter 13, I want to give you a little background. So first, uh, Jesse, show the map. So I think, I think Mel was kind enough to print out some maps because later in the lesson we'll get to what's going on with these maps. So when you look at the map, uh, on the lower left, it says Philistia next to the Mediterranean Sea. So you can kind of see Judah, the tribe of, these are the tribes of Israel. Uh, they're all in different colors. Judah's uh, kind of a, my wife would say, hibiscus color. <laughs> Pink. Anyway, Simeon's yellow. To the left of that is Philistia. In Philistia, there on your map, you can see there's the five major cities of the Philistines. We have Gaza. That's in the news right now, isn't it? The Gaza Strip, right? 
Ascalon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. And so those were the five city-states of the Philistines, so it was a coalition. So the five leaders or the five kings of those cities ruled the Philistines and kind of formed a conference, and they would make decisions for all the Philistines. And then uh, the other thing I want to show you on this map is when you see the gr right in the middle between Judah and Ephraim's purple is the small tribe of Benjamin, which is green on your map. Uh, that's the smallest tribe. And there on your map in your lap, if you look just to uh, the right side of Benjamin, above that is Gilgal. There's a town of Gilgal. We're going to talk about Gilgal tonight. Gilgal is actually in part of the tribe of Manasseh that comes down the Jordan River. And then uh, we've mentioned this before, the, the blue line down the middle is the Jordan River going from the Sea of Galilee at the top to the Dead Sea at the bottom. So the tribes on the right side, half of Manasseh, Gad and Reuben, are called the Transjordan tribes because they're the tribes of Israel across the Jordan River. Uh, today, uh, that is the country of Jordan. Okay, so uh, we'll, I wanted to uh, help you see that. And now what we're going to do is, uh, I've talked about the Philistines a little bit. They just keep popping up throughout the book of uh, Judges and now throughout uh, Samuel, and they're going to keep popping up you know, even through David's reign. Uh, but I found a really good eight-minute video on YouTube to kind of explain who the Philistines were. So let's roll that. Ultimately, Roman rule. The 
history of the Philistines is loosely derived from biblical accounts where they are depicted as adversaries of both the Israelites and their God. It's important to remember that these accounts are written from the viewpoint of the biblical authors where Israel, not Philistia, is the central nation. In the book of Genesis, the Philistines are described as already living in Canaan during the time of Abraham. However, many historians and archaeologists believe these references are anachronistic. The book of Exodus suggests that, during the time of Moses, the Hebrews didn't enter Canaan by the way of the Philistines because God was concerned that they might change their minds and return to Egypt if they faced war. In Joshua 13:2, the Philistine city-states are listed among the lands that Joshua was supposed to conquer but hadn't yet. However, Judges 3:1 to 3 explains that these territories were intentionally left unconquered by God's will to test the Israelites. The Bible tells of an ongoing struggle between the Philistines and Israelites particularly in the books of Judges and Samuel. During this time, the tribe of Judah allied with the Philistines and even helped them in capturing Samson, a famous judge of Israel. Samson himself had interactions with the Philistines, including marriage to a Philistine woman and a significant confrontation with her. The Philistines had a substantial influence over the Israelite tribes and held the upper hand technologically during this period. It's noted that the Philistines possessed iron-working skills and the Israelites were dependent on them for the production and repair of advanced weaponry. In a notable biblical account, the young David confronts the mighty Philistine warrior Goliath. This confrontation leads to the defeat of the Philistines and their retreat to Gath, a major Philistine stronghold. The Philistines continue to be a significant force in the region, and their presence is described in various military conflicts with the Israelites. The Bible records how King Saul became jealous of David, who had to seek refuge in Philistine territory for some time. In a significant battle, the Philistines defeated the Israelite forces at the Battle of Gilboa, resulting in the deaths of both Saul and Jonathan, Saul's heir. After this battle, the Philistines occupied the Jordan River Valley. David later ascended to the throne, and the Bible depicts him as having success against the Philistines. However, it's important to note that Gath, a key Philistine city, remained outside his control. The Bible provides fewer details about the Philistines in later periods. It mentions various confrontations between the Israelites and Philistines, as well as other nations' interactions with the Philistines. King Uzziah of Judah is said to have defeated the Philistines by destroying the wall of Gath. King Hezekiah also faced the Philistines in battles as far west and south as Gaza, although these victories were temporary. Ultimately, the Philistines lost their independence to the Assyrian Empire. Later, they were conquered by the Babylonians, and the former Philistine city became part of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Jeremiah 47 contains a prophecy against the Philistines, possibly related to an attack by Egypt during this time. The origins of the Philistines remain a subject of debate among scholars. It's widely accepted that the Philistines did not originate in the regions of Israel and Palestine described in the Bible. One key reason is the repeated reference to them as uncircumcised in contrast to the circumcised Semitic peoples, like the Canaanites. A leading theory proposes that the Philistines were part of a larger naval coalition known as the Sea Peoples. These Sea Peoples are believed to have migrated from their homeland in Crete and the Aegean Islands to the shores of the Mediterranean around the beginning of the 12th century BCE. They conducted repeated attacks on Egypt during the 19th dynasty, but were eventually defeated by Ramses II. According to this theory, Ramses resettled them to rebuild coastal towns in Canaan, which later became the Philistine cities. Archaeological findings at sites such as Ashdod, Ekron, Ashkelon, and Tel es Safi have strengthened the connection between Mycenaean culture and Philistine culture. Notable discoveries include early Philistine pottery, which resembles Mycenaean pottery in style, as well as architectural features reminiscent of Mycenaean structures. Inscriptions and archaeological evidence suggest a connection to the worship of the goddess. Some limited evidence points to the possibility that the Philistines originally spoke an Indo-European language. Several Philistine words found in the Bible don't belong to the Semitic language family and may trace back to Proto-Indo-European roots. Additionally, some Philistine names, like Goliath, Achish, and Fickle, appear non-Semitic in origin, and Indo-European etymologies have been proposed. An inscription found in Tel es Safi with names similar to one of the suggested etymologies of the name Goliath reinforces this 
Nigeria. The Bible, the Hebrew tradition associates the Philistines with Mizraim, Ehud, son of Ham, through mythology. Philistines, however, modern scholars. Pastor has been teaching on Exodus, so you know from the what he's shown us that the Ark of the Covenant was not quite as big as it showed up here. <laughs> Actually, they carried it, yeah. And I didn't know the Philistines were a nation of bodybuilders, you know. I'd like to know what kind of protein shakes they drink. I need some of that. <laughs> okay, all right, let's 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 move on. So, um Chapter 13, let's, let's see what we can get out of this tonight, okay? So uh, tonight we're using the New Living Translation, uh, so that will be the translation for all of the scriptures. I try to put that on the first verse each time so you'll know which one we're, we're coming from. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 42 years. Now, the reason I, I tell you that is uh, these uh, years came from the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint. Uh, some of the Hebrew versions, uh, they think they left out some numerals because it said Saul reigned when he was one year old, uh, and he reigned for two years. So, they, anyway, they're, they're not sure what happened there. But the Greek, the Greek uh, said he became king when he was thirty and reigned till reigned for forty two years. Okay, now let's read 2 through uh, 4. So Saul selected 3,000 special troops from the army of Israel and sent the rest of the men home. He took 2,000 of the chosen men with him to Michmash and the hill country of Bethel. The other 1,000 went with Saul's son Jonathan to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. Soon after this, Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of the Philistines at Geba. The news spread quickly among the Philistines. So Saul blew the ram's horn throughout the land, saying, Hebrews, hear this, rise up and revolt. All Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba. And the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. So remember Gilgal from our map. So so this is the first mention of Jonathan, his son. So obviously he's been king for a few years because Jonathan is old enough to lead a a garrison of a thousand men against the Philistines. Uh, And here we see Saul's first leadership failure. I think we're going to see three in this chapter. Uh, So Saul takes credit for Jonathan's victory. So Jonathan had a victory. Jonathan's obviously serving under his father Saul. Uh, but after Jonathan uh, has a victory, then Saul takes credit for it. Now the way they, it says, says Saul blew the horn. Basically the way they spread news back then. You remember, uh, I don't know if some of y'all saw the movie a couple of years ago. Tom Hanks was in it called The News of the World. But if you think about it, you know, right now news can go through the world instantaneously. You know, instantaneous. Something can happen on the other side of the world in a few seconds. We know about it here. Back then it was not that way. So until, really, until the telegraph and the telephone, you know, I mean, news was very, very slow. And so back then they had what was called heralds. So a herald was an announcer. I know when I was a... a um, boy growing up in Grand Prairie, Texas, the afternoon newspaper was the Dallas Times Herald. You know, in the New Testament, we had, we, uh, well, with Christmas time, we sing the song, Hark the Herald Angel, you know. So we, yes, Hark was the name of the Herald Angel. Anyway, so some of y'all get that on the way home. So, so what they did was they, they would have people, uh, kind of like the Pony Express, I suppose, But they would gather them together and say, okay, here's the news that you take to the land. And so each one went to a certain city throughout the land. And then at the, kind of at the town square, so to speak, they would uh, beat drums or, or, you know, blow the ram's horn. They had a certain thing to call everybody of the city together. And the herald would speak to the crowd to tell them the news from the capital, you know, what the, this is what the king has to say. 
And so that's how Saul blew the ram's horn through the, through the land. He didn't do it himself. The heralds went out and did that for him. But he had them say, Saul has won a great victory against the Philistines. Now, let's think about this. So Saul takes full credit. So what does a great leader do? What does a great leader do? In victory, you know, think about sports teams. In victory, a great leader gives credit to his team. If there's defeat, he takes credit on himself. And you've seen this in these after, you know, if you watch any sports at all, you know, talking to the coach after a game. And, you know, the really good coaches, you know, if their team wins, he'll give credit to this guy and this guy and this guy and the team as a whole. If they lose, he'll say, well, I, I had a bad game plan. I didn't coach them well enough. Or I called the wrong plays. So he'll take credit on them. He'll, he'll take the credit for the defeat. And that's what a great leader does. Well, Saul doesn't do that here. He takes credit for his son's victory. So I went to research and I said, what, uh, this is the, uh, I use a AI program called Claude AI. It's, it's very good for, it's kind of like Encyclopedia Britannica on, online. Uh, I put in what personality defects would make a leader take credit for something a subordinate does? And this is what I came up with. So narcissism, a narcissistic leader feels a strong need to be admired and recognized. So he claims credit for another's achievement in order to gain praise and bolster his self-image. In other words, a narcissistic leader is all about me. It's not about you. You're here to help me, you know, be, be the great one. So that's one, one uh, personality defect. Another one could be insecurity. An insecure leader does not have confidence in their own abilities and so relies on appropriating others' accomplishments to try to appear more competent. Third one, arrogance or pride. An arrogant leader believes they are superior to their subordinates and entitled to the glory that anything positive that happens under their leadership. Next one, selfishness. A selfish leader prioritizes their own image and success over properly attributing achievements within their team or organization. Next one, micromanagement. A micromanaging leader exerts excessive control over projects and feels that as the overseer, they have the right to claim responsibility for successes. And the last one is lack of integrity. Unethically taking credit for a subordinate's contribution shows poor judgment and lack of integrity on the leader's part. And so he, it ends up by saying claiming undeserved credit can foster resentment and mistrust in the leadership. A good uh, quote I found is in the John Corson commentaries. This is, this is good. I'll put this on your lesson sheet. The limb that bears the most fruit hangs the lowest. If you're truly fruitful, there won't be a lifting up but a bowing down. That wasn't the case with, with Saul. Because if you're a servant leader, you're always bending over to serve other people. A servant leader is not up in front wanting the praise and the glory. A servant leader is serving, doing whatever it takes to serve his people and his team. And I will say we are blessed at Ray of Hope to have great servant leaders. Pastor Mike, Pastor Matt, all of the teams, you know, they're not out there beating their chest. You don't see billboards with their name and their pictures on them. You don't even see their name on the sign out front of the church. Have you thought about that? Because this is to God's glory. This is not to their glory. Unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of churches is all about the preacher. You know, and they'll say, this is my church. It's not their church. It's Jesus' church. Right? So we're blessed to 
have examples of servant leadership here at Ray of Hope. Okay, verses 5 through 7. The Philistines mustered a mighty armor of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as grains of sand on the seashore. Ever wonder where that saying came from? Right here. Biblical, one of the thousands of biblical sayings that are in our language today. As many as sands on the seashore. So that's how many warriors they had. They camped at Michmash, east of Beth Haven. The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in. And because they were hard pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. Some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. So it's kind of like Jonathan's victory over them that we just read about stirred up the hornet's nest and kind of awakened the giant. I thought about, if you're, if you're old enough to remember uh, the sayings about Pearl Harbor in 1941, you may have heard this saying when they talk about celebrating Pearl Harbor that after the attack, the Japanese admiral that planned the attack, he wrote in his journal, this is what he wrote, he said, I fear that all we've done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. That's exactly what they did, wasn't it? They really didn't, didn't benefit themselves at all in the long run. They awakened a sleeping giant. So we believe that if you look at this chapter here, that's kind of what Jonathan did with, the, with his 1,000 men. He kind of awakened a sleeping giant, and here come the Philistines. So they muster 3,000 chariots, and back then, you know, our, our tanks of today would be their chariots of yesterday, and we're going to learn later, and it mentioned in, that's one reason I wanted to show that video, it mentioned how they had uh, benefit over the Israelites because they, they knew iron working. So they had, would have iron-clad chariots. Uh, horsemen, troops like sand on the seashore. So, you know, if they were coming against me, no, I think I'd go hide in a cave too. It says even some of the Jews crossed the Jordan River, so that's over on the map, to those Transjordan tribes. So the Philistines were this way to the west, and so Gilgal's near the Jordan River. The, the, the army has mustered at Gilgal, but with the threat of the Philistines, some of them cross the Jordan River and go hide over there, thinking, well, surely they won't come this far. So it says Saul stays at Gilgal because Samuel told him to wait there. When was that? Well, if you go back a couple chapters, chapter 10, verse 8. So this is chapter 10, verse 8 is seven days previously. So there's been seven days, chapter 10, 11, 12, 13. 10, verse 8, this is what it says on your lesson sheet. So Samuel is talking to Saul. This is after he anointed Saul as king. He said, go down to Gilgal ahead of me. I will join you there to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. You must wait for seven days until I arrive and give you further instructions. And so before they would go into battle, they would offer a, a burnt offering, a sacrifice to God to entreat God's blessing on their battle. And as a priest... Samuel was qualified to do that. So Saul is waiting at Gilgal, even though some of the men are deserting him because they hear the Philistines coming. Okay, now verse 8 and 9. So Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And, Paul, and Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. So here we are, in the, we are in the seventh day. And, you know, Saul's getting anxious. You know, men are running off. I'm sure his captains are saying, come on, come on, come on. We need, we need to uh, fight the battle before we lose too many men. So we've got a lot of pressure. He hadn't heard from Samuel, no instant message, no texts, no phone calls, no telegraphs. He has no idea, and back then they had no idea. 
So it's the seventh day. So he decides, I'm just going to do it myself so we can get on to battle. So he does. And obviously this is totally against God's instructions because God instructed only a priest from the tribe of Levi could offer a burnt offering to God. And we're going to learn about two chapters from now that in another leadership failure that Samuel tells Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God wants our obedience more than he just wants our sacrifice. So it's a tough situation. So we got this new king, Saul. Uh, he's supposed to lead Israel into battle. Uh, the men are, that are left with him are pressing him to hurry up and, and do the burnt offering because Samuel hadn't showed up. But he knows in his heart he's not supposed to. Uh, so he has a tough call to make, but he makes the wrong call. Uh, I've read many John Maxwell books. He's, if, if you want to read books on leadership that are Christian-based, read John Maxwell. He's really good. Uh, and one of the ones I have at home called Leadership Gold, this is what he said about making the tough call. Every leader faces tough times. And that's when the leaders distinguish themselves and show who they really are. Leading others can be very difficult and can take great courage. Of course, it's not that way all the time. About 95% of the decisions leaders make could be made by a reasonably intelligent high school graduate. But what is often required is common sense. But they don't get paid for those decisions. They get paid for the other 5%. Those are the tough calls. Every change, every challenge, every crisis requires a tough call. And the way those are handled is what separates good leaders from the rest. And then John Maxwell goes on to say that you know it's a tough call when it demands risk and when that tough call will be criticized. So the leader has to be able to stand up to the criticism and be willing to take the risk. And I've been, I've been blessed with being a lot of positions in my life. And I was thinking back, I was trying to think back the first time I had to make a really tough call. I was 21. It was the summer between my uh, freshman and sophomore years in medical school. And I'd worked at a Bible camp every summer for this was my fifth summer out in East Texas called Camp Deer Run. And that was a it set up a little bit different from the camps that we use here at Ray's of Hope, Ray of Hope. It was a, a camp that had its own staff of about 30, 35. and had about 150 campers every week. There were 10 weeks of kids. And so I had, through five years, kind of risen through the ranks, junior counselor to counselor to group leader, and now I was the camp director at 21. And so I had hired all the staff. A lot of them had been from the year be years before. To others, we'd went to Christian colleges and recruited. Anyway, but we had just enough staff. So we get the camp started. And three days in, on the first week, some of the campers come to me and say, is it okay if our counselor is smoking marijuana behind the cabin?" Anyway, so I immediately go find him and go talk to him, and, and he admitted it. I had nobody to take his place. I had a cabin full of kids, and he was going to be there the whole summer, so we had 10 weeks of the summer. Anyway, I said, you know, we really don't need that here. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you feel like it. He didn't see anything wrong with it. And he was from a Christian college. This is quite a ways back. Anyway, so I let him go, and I became not just the camp leader. I became a counselor for a 15, 10-year-old kids. And it, it was criticized by a lot of people, uh, but it was the right decision. Because you've got to do what's right for the group. 
you know, he had a friend there, and that friend sure didn't like it, but, you know, you got to do what's right. you got to, you got to make the tough call when you're in leadership. And we're not just talking about organizational leadership tonight. I mean, if you have a position in a family at work, uh, you know, any kind of school, you've got to make the tough calls. And you've got to be willing to take the criticism, and you've got to know there's, there's, there's risk to it. But the right thing is the right thing. And Saul was unwilling to do the right thing. That's a leadership failure. So the Philistines are threatening. Saul and his army at Gilgal. And Samuel, the man of God, said, You go to Gilgal and wait seven days. But every day men are scared, men are deserting. Every day his army is getting smaller. His captains are begging him to go ahead and offer the sacrifice. So he gives in. Let's see what happens next. 10 through 14. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet and welcome him. But Samuel said, what is this if you've done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So it's the seventh day. It's not the end of the seventh day. It's during the seventh day, Saul finally gives up, makes the wrong decision, does the sacrifice, knowing he shouldn't, and guess who shows up? Oops. Oops. I blew it. Samuel shows up. He says, how foolish, how foolish. You couldn't wait another hour or two. This is still the seventh day. I just said, wait to the seventh day. But you gave in because of all the stuff going on around you. You didn't stand up for what was right. So what does Saul do? Third leadership failure. Because you didn't show up when you said you would. He blames Samuel for his leadership failure. When you're a leader, you don't blame other people for your mistakes. You own them. You stand up for them. Craig Rochelle has a famous saying on his leadership podcast, which is a great podcast to listen to. He says, people are not looking for a leader who's always right. They're looking for a leader who's always real. And a real leader admits his mistakes. Because people need to know the leaders are human too. And they're, if they admit their mistakes, then they're going to not expect you to be perfect either. Because if a leader knows he's not in, he, that he's not perfect, he'd be more forgiving of other people. If you have a leader that thinks he's perfect, look out. You better run for the door. Because he's, he's going to think Anytime you're wrong, he's going to come after you because he thinks he's perfect. That's part of that narcissistic personality we talked, to, talked about a minute ago. Anyway, so, so his punishment, Samuel says, because you did this, your kingdom must end. Now, that doesn't mean Saul's giving up the kingdom right then. He's talking about his legacy. That he's, he's, his son's not going to be the next king, and his son is. So 
So he's saying God is not establishing a kingship for your family because of this. Because of what you've done here, the kingdom, uh, the kingdom in your family, the kingship in your family will end when you are no longer king. And you just saw in the video that here a little bit later, Saul and Jonathan are both killed in the battle with the Philistines. A good quote I saw for this was, Often God waits until the last moment to step in, not to tease us, but to test us. So Samuel showed up when he said he would, but maybe it wasn't quite quite as quick as what Saul expected. But in a way he was testing, he, he wanted to test Saul to see if he would do what he said. And so often I believe God is testing us. Not, he's not teasing us. He's not trying to give you a hard time. He's wanting to see your faith. He wants to see your faith. I looked up uh, le- uh, verses about wait on the Lord. You know, Saul should have waited for Samuel. We need to wait on the Lord. And I, I came up with at least 15 verses, and you could look them up sometime, about how we need to wait on the Lord. You know, we live in a microwave society. We want everything right now. And we expect God to jump when we say jump. But we need to wait on the Lord. A couple of really good books uh, that would... Uh, if you're looking for something really uh, good to read. I read the first one, Tyranny of the Urgent, by Charles Hummel. I read that many years ago. It came out in 1984. You can still get it on Amazon. And his byline is that we let the urgent things of life squeeze out the important things. So if it's important to worship, if it's important to pray, if it's important to study, if it's important to serve, sometimes we bypass those because there's something more urgent that's really not that important. So the tear, and it seemed like in, in Saul's case right here, the urgent thing was fighting the Philistines. But the tyranny of the urgent got to him and he did the wrong thing and he didn't wait for the important thing. And we can do that in our lives too. That's a really great, it's not a real long book, but it's a really good book. It helps you kind of, help you in your mind see what's really important. That each day there's important things we need to do. Don't let the urgent things that are not as important get in the way. And then a book that was just came out, Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. I've read some of his other books. My wife has uh, downloaded this book on the Audible and um, has listened to it. She's listened to it the second time. She's quoted me a lot of what he says. But uh, both of these books talk about the hurried, hurry lifestyle from our culture that we live in. And, they, and both books describe Jesus' life and ministry as one that's focused and unrushed. You don't see Jesus rushing from here to here to here to here. He's focused on what he's doing. He's deliberate. He knows what's important. And he doesn't let urgent things get him, get him off track. And so that's, if we're disciples of Jesus, uh, John Mark Coma calls us apprentices because we're trying to become like the master. That's what an apprentice does. Then we too need to learn how to live focused, unrushed lives that are focused on what's important and not detoured by the urgent things of life. So Saul once again fails the test. So that's three leadership failures in this chapter. Samuel pronounces judgment. Your kingdom will not continue. So your sons and grandsons will not be the kings of Israel. You will not have a legacy in kingship. So he lost his legacy. 
So our leadership failures can cause us to lose our legacy. If we don't lead our families in the way of the Lord, our legacy of our faith will be lost because our kids will not follow in that legacy, right? So it follows no matter what sort of leadership you have. Okay, verse 15. Samuel then left Gilgal and went on his way, but the rest of the troops went with Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. When Saul counted the men who were still with him, he had 600 left with him. So Samuel is so disappointed in Saul's moral leadership failures that he leaves. Do you get that? The very first thing says Samuel left. Samuel left Gilgal. So by his poor choices and decisions, Saul's first he first loses his legacy, but now there's an even greater loss. He's lost the guidance of God's prophet. Samuel. One of the study books I have is by Ralph Davis. He points out Saul's predicament. Here he's got 600 men against the Philistines who are like sand on a seashore. Many of his men have deserted to go hide or cross the Jordan to get away from enemy. We're going to learn in just a minute they really don't have very good weapons at all. His troops are demoralized, but Ralph Davis goes on to say this. The worst of Saul's liabilities was that he was without the guidance of God through his prophet Samuel. To be stripped of the direction of God's word is to be truly impoverished and open yourself to destruction. It is one thing to be in terrible distress. It is another thing to be alone without God in that distress. Saul had isolated himself from what he needed most, the Word of God for his life. So verse 15 is one of the saddest statements in the entire book of 1 Samuel. Samuel rose and went up to Gilgal, and so Saul is now on his own. And as we close the chapter, we're going to learn about the weapon situation to see why why it was such a terrible situation for the Israelites. You saw some of this on on the video. There were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear that they make swords and spears for the Hebrews. So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, or sickles, they had to take them to a Philistine blacksmith. The charges were as follows. A quarter an ounce of silver for sharpening a plowshare or a pick, and an eighth of an ounce for the sharpening an axe or making the point of an ox goad. So on the day of battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear except Saul and Jonathan. So this is their situation. This is the beginning of the Iron Age, and we read this through the book of Judges, that the Iron Age started about 1,200 years before Christ, where some people figured out how to harden iron into steel, and that's smelting it up to about 2,300 degrees, getting it hot, and then putting it in water. Think the old blacksmiths from the Western shows, heating up the horseshoes until they were bright red, then stick them in water. That would harden them. So they figured how to do that. Well, the Philistines kept that technology to themselves because they wanted to subjugate the Israelites so they wouldn't wouldn't sell weapons to the Israelites, but they would let them come to them and pay exorbitant, these are exorbitant prices, for working on their farm tools. And so we're talking about a third to a fourth of a man's monthly wage for working on one farm tool. So that's, uh, that's, that's what was happening. So they had the technology. So quickly, a couple of parables from these verses. Let's look at the second one first. So if you're an Israelite farmer, you want to be successful, 
and you have a few iron tools that you got from the Philistines, but you got to keep them sharp because you got hard ground to work with. And so you say, well, I've got to spend that money so I can be a successful farmer. It's kind of like today. You know, if you want a farm or you want any kind of business, you have to spend money. You have to invest money into your business so that you can be a successful business. And so, uh, so the, the enemy's charging a high price so that you can be a successful person. Uh, so the parable, real quickly, is that today the greatest asset that we have is our time, right? And so a lot of people give a lot of their greatest asset, their life or their time, so they can gain earthly or worldly success. And the enemy is happy for us to do that because... When we do that, then we experience failure in marriage, failure in parenting, and worse, we can, have, uh, we can lose our relationship with God. And so that's a terribly high price to play for worldly success. And so uh, there is a high price for, there can be a very high price for success in this world. The second parable, the enemy doesn't mind if you make a living, he just doesn't want you to have a sword. And so the Philistines didn't mind if, if the Israelites had farm tools to make a living. They just didn't want them to have a sword so they could fight them and win, right? So today, daily, we're in a spiritual battle. And Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. You remember what the sword was? The sword is the Word of God. So the enemy doesn't mind if we make a living. He just doesn't want us to have the sword, which is the Word of God. So he provides lots of temptations and lots of distractions because he'd rather us not spend time with the Word of God so we won't have a sword to fight him, right? So, you know, a lot of folks say, well, you know, I'm too busy. I don't have time. You know, I'd love to, you know, spend some time in the Word and study, but, you know, I just don't have have too much time. But we say, well... How much time do you spend with this? Oh, but I'm really busy now. I've got to have a little leisure time. Or or, how much time do you spend on social media or playing games on your phone? Oh, but I'm really busy. I just don't have time for the Word of God. But you know, if you don't have, if you don't put the Word in, you can't put the Word out. You know, garbage in, garbage out, good things in, good things out. So if we don't put the word in, you know, the enemy, enemy has a sword. You know, that's, that's why Paul talked about this as a sword. And, you know, the Bible doesn't say what his sword represents, but I can tell you it represents deception, distraction, destruction, and death. So he's got that sword and he's coming at you. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. If all you have to fight with is your cell phone, or your remote because you hadn't got the word in, you're going to lose that battle. So some of that leisure time we need to spend studying the word. If you want to, you know, there, there are lots. I, I suggest if you don't have a study Bible, get a good study Bible. Uh, a couple of suggestions I have that I found very helpful to me. Um, oh, a couple, a couple of uh, Christmases ago, Kathy got me a. It was called a cultural study bible it's a niv so it's very readable and every chapter there's three or four things about the culture that has to go with that chapter it's very very interesting helps me understand what's going on from that cultural standpoint so it's a cultural study bible of the uh with the niv and then uh one that um, i've had for several years now uh, i mentioned john corson a while ago uh my good good friend uh mike lapine uh, that passed away 12, 13 years ago. We were best friends. Um, he put me on to John Corson's commentaries. It's a three-volume, two on the Old Testament, one on the New Testament. But it's not a real highbrow commentary. It's not a bunch of Greek and Hebrew. It's very, very readable. And he'll have a few verses, then he'll talk a little bit. And a few verses, he'll talk a bit. So John Corson's commentaries, Old Testament, New Testament, are great, great study Bibles. Uh, so if you're looking for something, I can recommend those. But we need to get the word in so that we can fight with the sword. Because the enemy doesn't mind if we make a living. He just doesn't want us to have a sword. 
right? Okay, let's stand and we'll pray. Sorry if I kept you a little bit long tonight. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to come and worship, to study, to, Father, to be better disciples and to be better leaders in your kingdom. Thank you, God, for your examples that you've given us through the Scripture that we can study. Thank you, most of all, for your Son, Jesus. We pray this in His name. Amen.